Good morning. Would you stand for a brief prayer, please? Generous and loving God, you give us riches beyond measure and freedoms to enjoy. Pour your love into our hearts so it flows over into the world around us, spreading the truth and joy of how much you adore us. Let us ever be bright lights against the darkness of this world. With thankful hearts, we say amen. So say uh, hi or good morning to your neighborhood. Go Packers. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning.
church. It's an absolute blessing to have you here. To see God's face shine bright in you is truly a gift, and I enjoy the simple ability to be with you. I hope this hour is a great hour that you can find a little deeper root in the Word and in the Spirit and walk out knowing that you are truly loved. With that, let us... <coughs> Dear and gracious God, we give you thanks. Because once again, you've allowed us to open our eyes to see how wonderful it is to be a part of your creation. You have blessed us, Lord, with this hour to come and celebrate the glory of you in our lives. May it truly help heal the parts that need healing and lift us up to truly reflect your glory in this world. So that all who see us, they get to see you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. surrounded by music all my life. My mom played the piano, I took lessons, my dad played the accordion, and by watching him, I learned how to play chords on my first guitar, a silver tone from Sears. Then came the 60s. Bam! There it was, rock and roll, the Beatles, the Stones, they were all there. I ate that stuff up. I joined a rock band, I played bass with them for over three years. That's how I met my first wife, Vicki. And when I found out her parents both played guitar and sang, I thought, boy, I really fell into it. Then came marriage and moving to Racine and children. And in 1972, no greater love. You see, Vicki had been in choir for years, and as soon as we joined Resurrection Lutheran Church in Racine, she joined their choir. And at that time, I was kind of a lukewarm churchgoer. I took the kids to Sunday school, dropping off, that kind of thing. I just liked the fact that she enjoyed what she was doing. And she kept telling me about something special they were working on. And then on Palm Sunday of that year, 1972, I took our two kids to church, sat in a pew, and then the music, the words, the scripture verses that washed over me that day, as they performed that beautiful cantata, No Greater Love, all about Jesus' life and death and resurrection. Well, that day changed my life. I was struck. I felt God's spirit wash over me. I knew from then on, if I played music, it would be in church, worshiping our Lord. In 1997, we moved out here to Rochester and joined Norway. And Vicki convinced me to try a choir, which I had never done. And I had the wonderful privilege of sitting next to Orville Peters up in the choir room. I was hooked. Hey, I could even carry the bass part. And sitting up there in that balcony, surrounded by such great people, and the sound of the organ, that was very special to me. And I met Joanne Lovering, and we did the gift of love together from the balcony. She sang, I played guitar. I couldn't believe how special that was to be able to minister to people that way. I did some guitar stuff with the choir, but the most meaningful times for me was playing guitar along with Silent Night as candles were lit on Christmas Eve. And then Vicki and I decided to join Bellfire. How hard could that be, right? You only have maybe three notes to play? But I love bells. One of the things I liked about it is everybody had fun. I remember. Vicki and Gretchen Wall, that was Pastor Wall's wife at that time, down at the other table, laughing about everything. It was like it was crazy, but it was great times and great fun. After leukemia took my Vicki away, the choir was a real refuge. No matter how sad or lonely or hurting I was, those wonderful people and that music, they just seemed to be what I needed right then. And somehow, Lori had heard, Lori Nauer had heard that I was learning to play the banjo, and she invited me to play with Thankful Heart, which was actually something I had been wanting to do. And so that grew into what you see now, a few years later. And for me, this is just
just like the 60s, only with Jesus. <laughs> and speaking of the handball player, during all those years that I played, guess who stood right next to me that whole time for like 15 years? She's sitting right down here, Daryl Nelson. She had lost her husband to cancer some time back, and then God worked a miracle, and he brought us together to share our life's journey. And thankful heart played at our wedding. Not only had I fallen in it, I had actually stepped in it. It was wonderful. There is such a rich heritage of music here in Norway, going back to the organist that used to play the old foot pump organ up on the hill, all the way to the present with our beautiful organ, the choir, the hand bells, children's choir, thankful heart. And when I tell people we play rock music in a Lutheran church, it's like, no way. And I say, yes, way. Just check it out on YouTube. So whether it's been choir or bells or thankful heart or the holding evening services or silent night on Christmas Eve, music has been a huge part of my life here at Norway. So I hope that during our Shining Bright campaign, you will each take a few minutes to reflect on the importance of music for you here at Norway. Ask yourself today's question, how does music prepare your heart and mind and soul for worship? I bet that many of you, like myself, have experienced music bringing the word into our heart, your heart, in profound ways. That's why this campaign is so important. Its success will fund so many improvements here in our worship space so that our music can better serve and be a bright light that brings people God's word and God's love. So thank you for listening to my story about music. And don't forget to please stop at the quilting table on your way out, and maybe share your answer to our question, how does music prepare you for worship here at Norway? Thank you. Awesome. Now, uh, can we have all of our young theologians come on up front? We've got a game activity for you today. Let's see how well we can. judges before. So she goes to this judge and asks him for help, 
And this judge, he's kind of lazy, you know? And he doesn't really want to help anyone. He just wants to be a judge. And so he doesn't help. And she comes back the next day and says, hey, Mr. Judge, will you help me? And he says, no. And she does it over and over and over again. Until finally, he gives in. And he says, fine. I don't even care what you need help with. Let's just help you. And you can leave me alone. Now, that's kind of a weird story to talk about prayer, right? But I think you get it. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I think Jesus tells a story to just emphasize the need of regular prayer, right? This lady goes to him every day asking for help. And not every day does she get the help that she wants, does she? But eventually. Yeah, it's almost like Jesus gives us permission to badger God with our prayers. That's pretty cool. And so, yeah, Jesus tells us the story to give us insight of praying on a regular basis. But we, we're not always going to get the answers that we want, right? Like this lady went to ask for help every single day and didn't always get exactly what she was looking for. And that's sometimes how God works. Sometimes we ask God for all sorts of different kinds of things. And sometimes we get exactly what we were asking for. Sometimes we get maybe something kind of what we were asking for. And sometimes we get a totally different answer. But the point is, is that God is always answering our prayers. And it's a conversation. God calls us to be in prayer on a regular basis every day. Asking for this and talking about that. But one part of it comes into play with our clapping activity is we've got to be willing to listen, right? Not only do we got to pray to God and have a conversation with God, but we got to be able to listen to the answer. So today is my challenge to you to become a little better at paying attention. Do you think we can do that? Yeah. Just a little better at paying attention. No. <laughs> you don't think so? Uh-oh. Pastors are in trouble. But yeah, I think we can do that. I think we can go on uh, and try and pay attention a little better because being in conversation with God is not only talking to Him, but it's also taking do that this week? Yeah? You got something to add? Without rest, 
even for a moment. Here ends the reading of Ruth. You may be seated. You guys are such good Lutherans. <laughs> Grace and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is an understatement to say that I love football. I love football and everything about it. In fact, when I was born, the very first two things they put on my feet were a set of boots and a knitted football helmet. But nothing makes me more pleased than to see exactly what football is all about. And you can put a lot of different understandings in football, but the one thing that I think is constant with every team and every game is nothing just happens. Say that with me. Nothing just happens. But in fact, we have to be the catalyst for the change we want to see, particularly when we're playing football. Did anybody see the Packer game this last week? Yeah. Only two of you saw the Packer game this week? It is an absolutely wonderful example of the fact that nothing just happens. We are the catalyst of what we want to see happen. The game itself started off a little rough, didn't it? Within the first few plays, we found ourselves behind. The Packers were able to tie it up at mid at um, at midterm <laughs> halftime. I love football. At halftime, and then even after they tied it up at halftime, they made it uh, with some shaky grounds all the way to the end, and they ended up doing what in the last two seconds? Kick the field goal. Kick the field goal, and they won the game. But do you know how that game was won? I've been listening to the different commentators talk about that game and how ugly it was. But I've also heard that it was interesting that when the offense couldn't produce what they needed to, to win the game, the defense had to step up. And not only did they step up, they mastered that game. They controlled it. So much that the Lions only received one touchdown and they held them to field goals for the rest of the time. Because they did that, because they just didn't let the game happen because they were willing to put themselves out there and do whatever they could to be the catalyst for a winning game, the Packers won in the last seconds. Nothing just happened. We are the catalyst for change. Now, I love this teaching because I think it actually fits all of our lives. In fact, there's very little that we don't do that involves change. In fact, if you want a better job, it's not just going to happen, is it? In fact, if you want a better job, you have to study, you have to work hard, you have to look at different opportunities, and when the opportunities are in front of you, you have to jump on it. Also, if you are trying to find somebody and give them a kiss, if you want to kiss somebody, it's not just going to happen, right? You have to say, hi, my name is. Then you have to be nice and kind, and eventually, hopefully, if you're respectful and they like you, they might give you a smooch, right? Nothing just happens. We have to be the catalyst for change. I gotta tell you, this is why I love the book of Ruth. Ruth is probably my favorite book in the whole Old Testament. Why? Because it's so easy to read. It's written just like a novel. And in fact, it literally has all of the characters well-defined. The challenges that Ruth has to face are challenges just like we'd face today. And the way in which she's able to succeed is also the gift of the book of Ruth. Because everything that she does is what we need to do in order to succeed in life and in our faith. Because it tells us very clearly, nothing just happens. We are the catalyst for change. Let me give you a little bit of context for Ruth. Ruth has married this man named Elimelech, and there's a famine that has now hit Moab. They know that the famine is there, and in order for them to survive, they're gonna have to go into Bethlehem to be with Ruth's uh, mother-in-law, which is Naomi. As they go, they're only planning on being there a little while, and then they're gonna return. But they have brought their two sons, and they're hoping that everything's gonna turn out okay. But it doesn't. They're only in Bethlehem for, for a little while when Emelech dies. And now they're sitting there looking, Ruth is looking at her, her uh, mother-in-law Naomi, 
and her two daughter-in-law because at this time her sons have now married her. But it's still okay. After all, her sons will take care of her. And so she simply looks at beginning to form a new life where they're at. But then something else happens. Did anybody know from the book of Ruth what happens next? Both sons die. And so now Ruth has her mother-in-law Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, one of them named Orphrah. The other one's not even named. As they look at their situation, they realize they're in the worst situation you could be in. And in fact, the two daughters realize this. So what do they do? The one who is unnamed simply leaves. And Orphrah goes to Naomi, or excuse me, goes to Ruth and goes, I'm sorry. I can't handle this. I'm going to go back to my mother and my father. Now, I want to be clear, the daughters, there's nothing wrong with them. They're not evil. They're not bad. They're simply afraid. The problem is they walk out of the story. And when they walk out of the story, they also walk out of all the blessing that's about to become part of Ruth and Naomi's life. Now we have a situation where we have Ruth and Naomi. Ruth has now has a mother-in-law she has to take care of, but she doesn't have to. This isn't a blood relationship. She too can go back. In fact, Naomi looks at Ruth and says, go home. Just leave me to die. Don't worry about this. This isn't your concern. And what does Ruth say? No, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to take care of you. But then she again realizes nothing just happened. She can't just sit there. She's got to do something. So she decides, I'm going to do what I think I can do to get us food. I'm going to follow the gleaners. And every time I see any food hit the ground, every time I see anything left behind, I'm going to take it. Hopefully they won't get angry. I'm not going to mess with the prophet of the owner, who is Boaz. I'm simply going to take what I can, and hopefully we can live off of that. Well, as this is going on, Boaz comes in from Bethlehem. He looks out into his fields, and he's very pleased at what he's seeing, but then he sees something. Who is this lady in my field? Well, his foreman comes in and goes, that's, that's uh, Ruth. You know, the one who was married to your relation, Emelech. She goes, okay, bring her to me. Ruth goes before Boaz, and she's terrified because this man, it's his property that she's been gleaning the food from. And she looks at him and goes, I, I'm sorry, sir, but all I was doing was walking behind the gleaners. I was walking behind the individuals collecting the food for your prophet. I tried not to get in the way. All I'm simply doing is trying to feed me and my mother-in-law, Naomi. And Boaz does something that shocks her. Boaz looks at her and goes, why are you going from field to field? Don't do that. In fact, I want you to be right up there with my gleaners so that you can get the first harvest, the best of what we have. Not only that, I want to make sure that if you're thirsty, you go right on over there and you get water from the, where the men have drawn the water from the well. And they won't mess with you because I've talked to them already. You are going to be literally at the top of your game. I'm going to make sure you succeed. I'm going to make sure you have everything you have for you and your mother-in-law. Well, Ruth is blown away. Why? Why on God's earth would you do this for me? And Boaz says this. I know what you've done for Ruth. My relations have told me all that you've done for her, that you've even left Moab so that you could stay with her. And even when everybody else left, you took charge. You made a difference. You were the catalyst of change. And because of that, you and Naomi will be blessed. He was so impressed that Boaz, as it says in the scriptures, put his cloth around her. It is a way to say that he marries her. And from Boaz and Ruth comes the line of King David. And from King David comes Jesus. Jesus. Isn't that a neat story? Yeah. I could preach on this text. Thank you. I could <laughs> preach on this text for weeks because that's just one of the elements. But what I love about it is the affirmation that we need to understand. Nothing's just going to happen for us. If we want anything to happen, we have to be the catalyst. We have to ask ourselves, what kind of change do we need, and how am I going to make it happen? It's not just any kind of random change. It is a calculated change. So that no matter what it is, it produces what we want. <laughs> But the question is this, what is it that we are trying to do here? How do we respond knowing that nothing just 
happened is that we have to be the catalyst here at Norway. Well, that's in fact what this whole building project for our sanctuary is all about. It isn't about just changing for change's sake. It's literally looking at what can we do to lift up the core of what we hold most sacred. And from the very beginning, in fact, something that literally attracted Pastor Christie to this very parish to call our own home is that we hold in this parish a sacred belief. And that belief is that we are all we are family. It's not just a word we use here. It's not something that we randomly say. It's something we mean. And you can see it time and time again as anyone in our family who's in need has the helping hand that sticks out, that has the encouragement to keep going, that has the applause when they're succeeding. That is what family is. And not only are we family to one another, but we are family to God. And it's because that has been the core of our ministries and who we are, we are going to make sure that everything that we are about, including our sanctuary, reflects that. In the back, I am hoping for the biggest baptismal font you can imagine. If it was up to me, I'd put a lake back there, but they said no. <laughs> Why? Because we enter the family of Christ through what? Baptism. And when we leave, it should be the last thing we see. Because as we see the living waters that have claimed us, and the joy of Christ that has filled us, we take it into the world. And we should dip our fingers in the water and place it in our hands because it reminds us that we are loved that much. Now let me be clear. Putting your fingers in water and making the sign of the cross is not Catholic. <laughs> Did you hear me? <laughs> they do it. But everybody can do it. And that tradition goes way before the Catholic Church. Putting your fingers in the living water is simply a reminder that you are that blessed. The other thing I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do is we're going to move everything up here, out here. Why? Because as part of the family, you should see everything right in front of you. Because it's a table. Do you know the difference between altar and table? You do? Well, why don't you come up and preach for a while? <laughs> a table becomes an altar when we have the body of Christ on it and consecrated. That's what it is. But it is a table. And anybody here has your dining room table in your bathroom? No. Thank you. I'm glad somebody said, no, you don't. Do you put your dining room table out in the garage. No. no. You have your table front and center and your dining room. Why? Because that's where you gather to eat. And that's why the table needs to be out here. Because just like baptism is one of our sacraments, Holy Communion is the other. Have you ever thought that Holy Communion literally means community? That's what that means. It is the blessings of God as we are brought together as brothers and sisters around the table. Other thing I want you to think about what have you been looking at besides the big chunky man up front? Shirt. Have, shirts. <laughs> have you been looking at the back of the head of the person in front of you? It's a nice head, isn't it? But does that condone family? No. In fact, you will not see a church built today that has pews straight and across. They are all angled because when they are angled, you get to see who your family is. And as those angles happen and you see the family, it helps you see how truly blessed you are. So as you can see, not only are we looking at change, but the change has to have purpose. It has to have meaning. I could talk about all the electrical that needs to be done. I can talk about different things behind the walls, but that's not as fun as the things that will literally help shape us. But my hope is that as we look at this building project, we understand it is much more than a building project. It is literally our efforts to make sure that everyone, everyone, everyone who walks in our church can understand what we hold to be sacred. And just like you watched me put on these jerseys, which by the way is the chronological order of the teams that I've supported in my life, it also shows that even though I've been able to celebrate different teams to be able to be a part of the communities that I'm serving, it doesn't mean I have to give up who I am. 
And just because you've seen the changes happen, it's something that is built on what was instead of getting rid of what always has been. But that's the blessing. And that's what God's calling us to do. Because we know that nothing just happens. Say it with me. Nothing just happens. And as long as we are willing to be that catalyst, every child will know this is a family of God that they too would want to be a part of. The only things left is do you want to be part of the team? Amen? Amen. It's so hard. <laughs>
knowing the one in whom we trust. And with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need. Grant us joy in these autumn days. As the daylight shortens and summer's green abundance decays, scatter the seeds that will bring forth new life in the spring. Keep watch over your whole creation. Lord, in your mercy, our help comes from you, maker of heaven and earth. Hear the cries of those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Chris, Kathleen, Rachel, Wally, Earl, Donna, Steve, Chris, Stephen, Audrey, Charles, Robert, and Veronica, and 